Welcome back. Let's stick with the quantitative approaches in the soil context and take a closer look at how the algorithms actually work. I'd like to look at the spectral feature analysis first, as this is a really well-established method. Spectral feature analysis is based on an empirical relationship of the spectra with the samples. As you know, some soil properties directly influence the spectra, causing absorption as certain wavelengths. Thus, they are called spectral absorption features, or simply features. The shape and the position of such a feature allows for the identification of the soil property that causes it, without the need for reference data. Now, the parameterization of the feature, for example, by its absorption depth or spectral slope, allows for the quantification of the soil property that caused the feature, relative, if knowing situ data is available, but even absolute, when combined with in situ information. This step is also called quantification by calibration. The simplest way to parameterize features from hyperspectral data are narrow band spectral indices. Spectral indices are combinations of bands at different wavelengths and designed to maximize the sensitivity to a given biophysical or biochemical property, not necessarily only soil properties. The advantage of indices is that they are really easy to calculate, and there are several well-established combinations. A more sophisticated way to parameterize features is the analysis of the actual shape, including the, for example, band position, shoulder positions, feature width, depth, and area. This is a little more complicated to assess, but helpful tools exist, like EnsoMap in the EnMap box. This approach can be used only when you are looking at a soil property associated with a chromophore, a direct response on the soil spectrum. This method is very robust and a frequently used approach that allows more accurately determine semi-quantitative compositional information of the soil surface without any ancillary input data. A disadvantage of spectral feature analyses and spectral indices is that they are only proxies for complex mixtures of soil properties. In addition, these features, shapes, and depths may be affected by external factors and may not be transferable between different environments. Besides, these methods rely on empirical modeling and thus need in situ reference data to determine absolute quantification. In this regard, they have similar restrictions as more complex approaches like chemometrics. Chemometrics are actually the other methodological category I want to present in more detail. They include a variety of algorithms, such as multivariate statistics, artificial intelligence, or machine learning, including most recently, deep learning. First developed in food science in the 1960s, these methods divide the available spectral and soil chemical information in calibration, validation, and test data sets. From these data sets, models are created that eventually allow for the prediction of variables from mean data. These methods often achieve high accuracies and are transferable within the boundaries of calibration and validation data. However, to establish a robust model, training data are required. Different approaches exist for calibration and validation that allow for reduction the amount of in situ data needed. For some methods, less than 50 reference samples are sufficient. For example, PLSR, random forest or support vector machines. Other deep learning approaches, such as multi-layer or deep neural networks, require a large training database. Several hundred or even thousands of samples are considered the minimum. One opportunity to access large training databases are soil databases, including soil spectral libraries that contain thousands of soil samples. Such libraries are assembled from dried and sieved soil samples, usually to less than 2 mm particle size, and acquired predominantly under laboratory conditions. In addition to the soil spectra, soil databases contain information on various chemical and or physical soil properties. Examples of standardized, large-scale soil spectral libraries are the European Lucas Soil Survey that is available on the web, the OSSL from the Woodwell Institute in the U.S., or the BSSL from the Sao Paulo University in Brazil. The availability of large-scale databases such as Lucas, in combination with advances in computational abilities and big data modeling, recently led to advances in the use of deep learning 
and AI in soil spectroscopy, predict chemical and physical soil properties from spectra. On the one hand, soils are very complex and highly variable, and relationships are often nonlinear and of increasing variance. On the other hand, the high dimensionality of spectral data can be a curse. That and the increasing availability of samples require further developments to achieve more robust standardization and common protocols, especially when samples have multiple origins. Well, that was quite a bit of input. Before we conclude, I would like to go back to the soil properties retrieval by soil spectroscopy that you got to know in the previous lesson and how they correspond to our methods. To the left, you see the primary properties that are directly linked with the spectra as they have a direct impact and cause spectral features. Consequently, these can be derived via spectral feature analyses approaches. The secondary properties on the right do not respond directly in the spectra. Well, at least not in the visible to short wave infrared wavelength ranges that we consider here. However, these variables can still be derived detour via their correlation with one or more of the primary properties using chemometrics. Okay, summing up. In order to get the most out of your data, the overall workflow for the retrieval of soil properties using imaging spectroscopy data consists of selecting orthorectified reflectance data, ensuring data quality, for example, by spectral smoothing or removing noisy bands, selecting bare or at least semi-bare soil pixels to which the subsequent algorithms can be applied. Masking using spectral features or spectral unmixing can assist with that. Once the data is readily prepared, consider spectral normalization, for example, continuum removal or another transformation like principal components, higher derivatives, or absorbance. And finally, apply your selected soil algorithm, whether to your small local dataset or a large database from the web, from a simple spectral index to a sophisticated model. If you like, you can project the quantitative soil values onto geographical maps. Thank you, folks. I know that was a lot, and I think that some of the concepts I explained above do become a lot clearer when you actually work with them. So let's go and try some analyses yourself in the next lesson.